Hello everyone, um, this is the last day of Destroy All Heroes, it was only out for a week and um, I suppose I want to say a few things about it, um, thanks for coming anyway and uh, myself, Laura, who is the artist we'll be talking with today and she's an exhibiting artist here and Emma who's, we, myself and Emma have kind of worked on the last two shows here uh, for peripheries and they, in a sense, we kind of co-develop them, we don't like to say we're curators, but we kind of come in and just kind of work around an idea and then we get artists together. We are curators, essentially. Uh, but just here, you know, exclusively here, really. And um, so this has been a kind of nine months in the making. And it's kind of sad it's only up for a week. Um, but a lot of work has gone into it, a lot of conversations have happened, a lot of studio visits have happened. and. Um, so here we are today, the last day. Um, Laura's work is right behind us here. And um, I suppose my first question is um, art and text. And my experience, and I've said this before to you in the studio, is that uh, usually artists do with art and text, uh, especially in Ireland. I, I often see them as an art critic in, in art colleges, mm -hmm. and then they don't transition into the art space, the art scene and they become video artists or you know, they change tact or they become writers in a sense. But in America is very common, um, uh, art and text artists. Mm -hmm. They kind of, like I have a book here, of them. so I, I brought this along, uh, art and text and contemporary art. Um, but in America it's very, um, it's very common, uh, kind of binary relationship between uh, image and text. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, so I suppose we start with that question, image and text, why? Okay, um, I think like for me text and like visual imagery is something that I've always been interested in and I think it does relate to like a very domestic beginning um, so things like shopping lists and um, words that are like jotted down on paper um, like notes to self that are like left on kitchen tables or um, road signs, but like road signs that aren't necessarily like official, but more like um, small homegrown. Like I've always been really interested in that um, and how things get like scrawled down, um, especially down, I guess, living like in a rural community, a lot of text is used in a kind of, um, almost like as an act of a revolt. So a lot of small holdings in the in the rural landscape would maybe want to challenge, say, what they would class as the uh, local authority. So um, if there's like a problem with like local roads, um, you might get somebody who would make their own homegrown sign who would say like this road is now falling down, as opposed to like the official version. So I think in a way like that subconsciously is kind of like filtered into the language that I'm using in my work and then I guess like uh, artists like Philip Gustan like I went to see a show of his drawings in House of Work like, a few years ago and they were like the Nixon drawings so there's maybe like I think there's about like 200 or 300 in the gallery just like rows and rows and rows of them and um, that kind of idea of storytelling but the storytelling not necessarily just becoming text but it becoming more of a um, like a pictorial kind of text um, and then like artists like Elizabeth Price, like the video artist, she uses a lot of text in her work. And I've always been re really interested in the idea of how you build like a um, like a visual essay, um, and rather than like divorcing the text from the image, I find it more interesting when they're like in involved together. Like there's more of a conversation there for me. But I think like this show and the studio visit that we have beforehand like led the work into um it gave me, me permission to kind of uh go with that because i think maybe that's something that comes up in our college crits actually is that like are you permission you know when you have kind of an idea to run with something but then either it's like outside of the remit of the references that you're sort of surrounded by so like i think when i was in ncd like there was a different canon of kind of work and, the, and, and art and text wasn't necessarily part of that canon. Like you would get very beautiful like art object books um, with really interesting pieces of text and really interesting images, but rarely would that be kind of 
um, yeah. combined. Yeah, so I think like um, permission is kind of important. And actually the word permission is really important in my work, I think, across it, many levels, you know, the idea of kind of uh, permission to have um, a message written down or uh, permission to allow a, a word to be put on paper is kind of part of that as well, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, I just kind of made to reassure that there's still, like, James has written a really nice book about um, mm. one liners for just about this work. Yeah. But um, that there still remains this kind of real ambiguity between the mark making and the text that they kind of, kind of become one. Mm. Um, so I can talk about, about that, that there's kind of like the, the writing becomes drawing, the drawing becomes kind of. Yeah. The, the writing becomes quite abstract sometimes, I suppose. It's yeah, not, um, yeah. It's not descriptive or it's not telling us what. What's going on exactly about in every single one of them? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we still have to do this little work, I suppose. That's kind of interesting. Because I like, um, I think when I moved back to um, Kerry like two years ago, I really enjoyed um, my dad's um, shopping lists that he'd leave on the um, table, and they're always made out of. Um, he really likes yogurts, and so he would eat like. Um, uh, and the yogurts come in cardboard uh, kind of packaging that go that surrounds like say four individual cards and he never throws away any cardboard so he um tears them into like equal squares and then has a stack of them about that high uh, and their material for his lists and his lists are often like dog food diesel copper piping dante because <laughs> he's like read somewhere like who's dante now i must check that out now i google that um so they're really like I really love them though because they're so abstract and they're kind of like they do that thing in your head where you're like kind of go like they make perfect sense and then there's this like mad absurd leap within them and I really like that and I think that's not just confined to like dad shopping list like I think that's quite a, a like I don't know is it like an art phenomenon or like a just something about text that like when you get these leaps and I, like Ireland's full of it and as well because of um you know, like the changeover from like old Irish to new, to the new version, you get uh, villages called like two top new townhouse or whatever, you know, these kind of like absurdist titles that come from like a translation. So I think like somewhere in my drawings, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like run with that. Like the gap, the gap is where it becomes interesting, where not everything is like sp told to you. And I think I probably would have, would have, Maybe this is kind of I feel like quite recent work. Well, it is recent work, but like allowing that move to be there, where you there's, there's like that little bit of bit of a moment where you're like trying to figure out what's going on, or it's open rather than being closed. I think maybe uh, like that's where I'm happier to keep the work at, where it's like still spinning a bit. For sure. Do you know? Yeah. And then when you could you say a little bit about Brian Rock, so uh -huh. the features in all the artists, so that everyone. Oh yeah, yeah. Understand where Brian um, is from. So is he a pseudonym? Is he? Um, it's like he's kind of shape shifting. I don't know where he's at now. Um, but it started uh, with so there's um, a man called Bishop Casey who's from uh, the the side village where I'm from, and Bishop Casey was very famous in the late eighties for having a Ill illegitimate child with his housekeeper uh, Annie Murphy, and um, they would often be seen strolling romantically around in speech um, on you know priest priest dates. Um, but he, again, my dad speaks really nicely about him because he kind of opened up um, what came afterwards, which was quite dark and, and involved like a lot of pedophilia and child abuse. But he essentially didn't do anything that was um, terribly dark. I mean, he had a, he was in a relationship and he had a child with somebody. Um, now, he, he did um, deny the fact that the, the child was his for years and years. And obviously that, that was problematic. But he kind of, in a way, it was like a catalyst for change, and it was actually a really uh, seismic change, and especially like where I'm from. Like I remember Annie Murphy went on to write a book called um, Forbidden Fruit, and I remember someone got it as a present from my granny for Christmas, and she was, I think she took to the bed for a few days because, like, this was such a terrible thing to be, you know, this kind of authority to be challenged, and um, it was around the era where, era where Father Ted was being broadcast on BBC or Channel Four, was it? Mm -hmm. Um, and the Irish RTE, I don't think would touch it because it was too close to the bone. But so there was all this kind of like backdrop happening. So Brian Rock comes from the wall of Bishop Casey's house, which is only about I think it's about a mile from Dad's house, 
um, and it's a really gorgeous it, it's called Redcliffe House and it, it overlooks the ocean and um, I so I stole him on a walk uh, just because I was kind of thinking about like collecting things and I've always been interested in that idea of like um, landscape and place and then I've started thinking about like place becoming dislodged from place and like bringing place with me so Brian Rock and some other stones came with me to Dublin I, I was doing a residency in um, Art Museum of Modern Art and then a lot of it like was like play as well like because I think I got really frustrated with art, art becoming like really um like I was really bored for a while in the studio like I wasn't enjoying it and finding it really like um I just thought I could have, be having a lot more fun like actually having a real job you know what I'm saying I was like this is supposed to be a really fun creative space and like it's boring so I started like playing um so I got so I brought my stones up to Dublin and then was that um, after your MA? Or yeah, after the MA. So this was like last year, and then I was living in Inman, the Museum of Modern Art, doing the residency, and then I I quite fancied a barman who lived across the road from Inman, um, and I decided to, I'd try and find out whether he was single or not. So I uh, made a Tinder account for Brian Rock, um, and then set the distance setting to like one kilometer, one kilometer, um, away from Inman. And then I spent like two nights just like scrolling through everybody to see um, would he come up. <laughs> what was his profile like? Uh, I knew his first name, I didn't know his surname, okay. but I think I'm totally... Oh, this, oh, yeah. oh, this is the real person. This is the real person, person. yeah. Brian so Rock. so Brian Rock's, some of Brian Rock's research did um, overlap into my own life. Um, but, but then I kind of realised that there was like a lot of actual kind of traction within this. And like the, there is this kind of idea of like desire and... Um, like searching and like a lot of things that I'm interested in my work like digging and searching and so I kind of like was laughing at how ridiculous I was being <laughs> <laughs> trying to track this guy down and, and, and as a stone as well um, and I did find him actually eventually and we did go on a few dates but I don't think he quite enjoyed my stone collection you know he didn't quite see it as a conceptual art project I think he was always a bit mad mm. um, so Brian Rock then Kind of became this thing of like how do you live in different spaces like how do you live in a digital space and how do you live in a real space and then it became sort of like again like a permission to talk about things and like rather than i've never really been interested in portraiture like i hate portraits um and i was doing a Lucian freud uh residency in emma and his work was all about portraiture so i was trying to think of like how like how can i how can i make portraits or how can i talk about like, emotions and like uh psychological states without like bringing up people and then so so it kind of like it just kind of it kind of stuck um and then i've kind of really interested in pishogs as well being from kerry so pishogs is kind of this thing where um uh, things are moved around it's like superstition is tied to it and like you know folklore and fairy culture and like dad was telling me about one there when his home that Apparently there was this fish over that if you oh yeah we we've, we've got a a water font it's an old um holy water font on the farm and it's on a wall between two um fields and uh, dad warned one of the neighbors uh, not to move it because apparently if you move the um this water font it's made of stone um, but it will move itself magically back to where you took it from the next day but you'll also be ridden with bad luck then for the next couple of years. So I really like that idea of like things moving and you know it's kind of the idea of um the stones the stones moving around in all sorts of kind of a multi a kind of multi like transversal way of moving. And then actually I, I was home a few days ago and I met this geologist in the local club at home and he was talking about like erratic rocks. Um so this idea of like rocks being really erratic and having this kind of like motion to them. And um, he told me there's this thing called the Interconglomerate, and it's rocks that were, um, when the sea was 100 metres higher around where we were from, the rocks would have like, moved up over time and are now like lodged. Actually, um, and he mentioned one of the, the places where the rocks, there's really good examples of them, is in Redcliffe, where the Bishop Casey's from. So there's all this kind of like uh, circling, it's, it, it, I guess it's like building a symbolic order. So like rock, uh, Brian Rock is my symbolic order to try and make sense of things and to laugh, to laugh at the absurdity of everything that I found absurd. Yeah, thank you. Your like your art also, also reflects on being an artist. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, in, within it, there's kind of a lot of criticism. 
Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. And um, like as an art critic, I know that a lot of criticism gets recycled. Mm. Into you know when you say something about art, it kind of gets recycled back into the art scene, and it's kind of it loses its impact over time. Then people forget. And you know, just there's, there's a sense that it doesn't have an impact. But your work, just kind of a play. You're being humorous, or you're being sarcastic, or you're being um, mm. you're kind of showing it up. But um, it yeah. is about the systems of being an artist, like grants, residencies, funding, yeah. um, all these kind of, um, I suppose the system of being an artist and trying to, to live, I mean, mm -hmm, trying, mm -hmm. you know, art is work. Yeah. You know? um, can you speak a little bit about that? Um, like, um, there's a book by Simon Critchley, it's called On Humour, mm -hmm. and um, he talks about like um, humour as an antidepressant, and I think um, for me, like for ages after, like doing a masters and stuff, I just found the whole like art system um overwhelmingly nihilistic, and the further I, um, I think it maybe it's like becoming vegan, um, all of a sudden you just realise I'm not a vegan, but like <laughs> when you become <laughs> vegan, you realise like how 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 corrupt everything else is by contrast, and I think um uh, something that was I guess uh, you probably understand them as well from doing turfs in London, like some of, I guess because, I guess because in England as well, there's like such an uh, emphasis on like professional practice and like, and it's sort of such a legit um, career path to become an artist, but yet you're, you're also saddled with all the, um, the heaviness of that. Um, so I, I think I just totally, um, like became totally overwhelmed by the structures of art. And the only way I could find myself, find my way out of that was to start laughing at how ridiculous it all was. But but at the same token, I don't like discount the art world, or I don't um, want to, I do want to be part of it. Do you know what I mean? Because otherwise I would just stop being an artist. So it's more like trying to, I think it, for me, it's trying to make myself laugh and maybe hopefully someone else might laugh too in order to continue along that road, but maybe like rupturing some of the, like the really kind of concrete ideas about that structure um, for myself anyway, um, in order to like get like maybe other ideas around it or something. Maybe to stop making it so heavy. So like the idea of grants and um, bursaries and residencies and like trying to find fun, like the idea of play as well, you know, cause it, no matter how well the, the money and bursaries and residences are going, if it's really, if it's really terrible in the studio, that's the worst place you could be. It might, you might as well be in like Mount Joy. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. But you know, like it's not great. Really, like it's very, it's very rough when it's bad. And yeah. um, so I don't know if that answer your question. Oh, it does. It does. It does. But, but for me, it was really when they're coping with the and the Yeah. All these especially some of the video works um, that we don't have here but there's yeah. kind of like lots of derogatory comments towards joy different systems and um, mm. institutions and stuff and then in the next scene might have this kind of real desire to be in, in the thick of it kind of it's kind of a yeah pull kind of a thing or, or running away from it and coming back in and we're yeah. crying as it was anyway because I think like I realised that over the last uh, year or two that I really enjoy making stuff and I think I've forgotten that as well like it's such a s simple like really rudimentary thing but I think I've completely forgotten that actually I find it I get real joy from it mm -hmm. so I think the videos and the, the drawings like oscillate between like really um, like they're being joyful about maybe something that I find really depressing like I remember like I know it's slightly different but I remember my dad took me to buy he asked me that I wanted to like pick out a fit kitchen once and I um I remember I, d I just remember like I really felt like we were going out to pick a tombstone like I never in my life have been anywhere more depressing than a fit kitchen mm -hmm. showroom mm -hmm. like I think I would really like to make a video piece about that sometime because they're just like I remember feeling it was so 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 sad the space and that's kind of where like the, the, the washing machine like I've never been so happy you know, that kind of idea of like arriving at something and finding it like so lacking, but then like trying to really find the humour in that situation to kind of make it joyful again. Mm -hmm. You know, like not falling into the washing machine, but mm -hmm. like putting the wash on. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you're kind of altering the everyday in a sense, you're altering these kind of really... So, yeah, I want to, yeah, yeah. so I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like, um, 
like, what is it, Sonny Fishy says, I did write it down actually. Mm. Um, <laughs> it says, um, this is why melancholy animals that we are human beings are also the most cheerful. We smile and find ourselves ridiculous. Our wretchedness is our greatness. So kind of, you know, the idea of, um, like if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, so with art as well, I think, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. There's something you inter you're interesting you wrote on your website, mm -hmm. and it was documenting. Um, I drew these all winter. Yeah. A series of um, ten on. Shannon's paper. Shannon's paper. Yeah. Um, I just want to read this out. I, I thought it was really interesting because um, I read it this morning, and it says, um, "Quote: Place a small coin in the center of the page. Taking a fine nib pen, draw around the circumference of the coin." Remove the coin and continue to draw in a circular motion following the pattern of the previous circle. Follow this motion, building up the circles over a period of hours, days and months. Eventually the winter will pass. Mm. So it's the, like the, the last line is the kind of the... Yeah. You know, the summing up, like there's kind of, there's a lot of humour in that, like that, in that you're giving yeah. someone uh, a way of getting through the winter, but there's also like this humor, and there's also kind of a dark mm -hmm, edge mm -hmm, to it, mm -hmm. you know. Like, I suppose, I do, like, I do think things influence you, like, as in, I think I was talking to you about this. Like, one of my probably first um, introductions to meditation was um, around like 12 or 13. Um, Dad had had a lovely Lamborghini blue tractor, and um, I was allowed, uh, he would plow a field first and then there's a smaller machine that goes on the back, it's got a harrow and it's got like finer blades so it makes the, gra the ground, it, it, it runs through the earth so it makes the earth much smoother and then um, I was allowed to sit in the tractor and he would set the speed, it would, it would literally be going um, like walking pace around the field um, and then he would be in the field picking up stones out of the way of the tractor and putting them into like small mounds in the field. Um, but that maybe went on for like hours, you know what I mean? So it, I think like in those drawings, I'm trying to talk about time um, and that kind of experience I had with time very early on. I, I don't know, maybe lots of people have that early on too. It, maybe it's just like, maybe it's a very universal thing that you have when you're younger, but all of a sudden you become very aware of like uh, the kind of the, the, like thickness of time and, and the, the kind of, um, you know, you're swimming through it. Um, but for me, uh, those drawings were very similar to that, just sitting in the tractor. Um, and all I had to do was like turn the wheel like ever so slowly. And these fields were like really huge. So like, you know, you might be going around, you might, the furniture might take 20 minutes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but there was something really uh, sort of zen-like in being in that space and the sound of the tractor um, and the kind of vibrations of it and, and then the clink of stones being put in mounds. For me, those drawings were very much about that. Um, but there is kind of like a mental resilience required to do those drawings and also to work the land in that way or to draw in that way as well. You know, it's kind of like, um, I guess a little bit like running as well that you do push through, through, I suppose, what would you call it, philosophical walls or something mm -hmm. when you're doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a very like interested in like seasons and like art seasons and like times of production and time and dry spells and because that would be very much tied to like agriculture and kind of what I grew up with you know hearing about it was like you wouldn't really talk about the week in terms of like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday but you would talk about it in terms of like yeah like seasons mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like the idea of that in the studio practice as well because I, I, I think that I think that applies actually I don't think mm -hmm. you can I don't think you can produce all the time or I don't think you can, you know I think it's kind of like you have to farm it in a way um, in terms of drawing, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and also, I guess those drawings, yeah, like, draw, it's funny looking back and then now that series, because they're just like black circles, and there's like 12 of them, and I, like, yeah, it was strange, it's strange what draws you into the studio, do you know what I mean, like, it's strange the impulse I had to go to the studio every day to do those, you know what I mean, mm. but I was like absolutely committed to it for like an entire winter. Um, yeah, it's a funny one. Mm. And your drawings before that, like your, the drawings I would have remembered from mm. college, would have been really, really obsessive in a different way, I suppose. Yeah, and it was yeah, yeah. Shift, so it's kind of interesting that um, that obsession seems to kind of run through all the different 
kind of work, I suppose. Yeah, and I think maybe I've shifted the focus. I think maybe the obsession is going in towards the video work now, maybe, yeah. um, and away from the drawing. But it's funny, I, I, I've mentioned this to a friend a few times about, um, I used to make very, like, tight, like, super detailed, repetitive um, at the drawings of, like, stones and stone fields and, um, like, very hyper detailed. But I remember saying to a friend I went to the RCA with that, like, they were making me really sad drawing them like really sad i had to stop i was like um it somehow bef i think before they felt like they were like it was like plowing it was like turning up new stuff but then it came to a point where i just had to stop actually because i felt like they were they needed to kind of like be more outward looking of which these ones are now um and these ones make me laugh when i make them you know like a I, I, I sometimes laugh when I'm in the studio. Which is, is that important? Is that the feedback you're getting from doing work? Like you get a moment where you laugh, or is, like everyone, every artist gets some kind of kick from their work. Kick. Yeah, um, I do, and sometimes it come like sometimes it's like when I go for a walk, or sometimes it's like when I'm cleaning the house or something, and I think of it like a one liner, and I kind of giggle, and then I'm like, she's going to split that down there. But I have to write it down because I'll forget it. Mm. Um, but yeah, it seems to be more like that these days. Um, and I write a lot just like, you know, on the computer, like, you know, little stories and that. And um, I did a lot over the winter when it was snowing. Um, I wrote a lot and I, yeah, if I can laugh, I don't know, it just breaks it or something. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of, it, it, it makes me want to make more stuff when I laugh. I guess I just like laughing, you know, mm -hmm. um, like. And then tension, because some of these, like particularly the washing machine, mm -hmm. I really, like I'm really drawn to it, or the tired ones, because they're so like domestic now. So <laughs> many and all the boys. Um, but they, uh, they're really sad. Some of them I find they're even just yeah. kind of the idea of being in fields with stones under it. it the, there's a kind of real um, darkness to them as well, I suppose, and that's kind of dark humor. Yeah. And not just. I think I'm kind of wary of saying that they're just about humor, just about not that I, I don't know this huge value. Yeah. But just that they're kind of. There's so much more going on with the, and the marks are so kind of um, intuitive and you know, there's an awful lot more, there's more of a profundity kind of. Happening. Yeah, yeah. But I, th I think like, um, like even the kind of area where I'm from, because there's such a like, kind of history storytelling stuff, but it all comes with like this like massively dark yeah. kind of side to it. And um, I think, yeah, like <laughs> to quote my dad, he, beware of a white man's fury. He always says to me, <laughs> so like, or like, he also has another one about like, oh, smiling people, watch out for them as well, or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, definitely, there's, um, I think they're wrought out of like, a, uh, I don't know what you call it, like, um, melancholy is not, it's not melancholy, but it's definitely kind of like digging out, like, darker, like, there's a darkness to the humor, I think. Yeah, I think definitely. But melancholy, like I do find melancholy because they drag, mm. you know, they, melancholy is yeah. dragging. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So, but like in relation to Raymond Pettibon's work mm. and David Gobbo's work in the mm. room, who are both kind of using one liners underneath mm. captions, mm. like like your tone is a little bit different, it's a little bit more vulnerable, there's like, like some mm. of them are quite vulnerable, mm. Like, mm. like there's one in the corner that are just with shit. Mm. And, you know, they kind of, and what I found interesting in your studio is that you mm. had these first drawings that were packed. Yeah. They were like maps. Yeah. And yeah. had loads of writing. Yeah. And then when it comes to the finished piece, they're kind of, you you edit them down to the yeah. point where they have barely anything, you know, they're kind of, you keep on editing down. Yeah. And yeah. That's what I found really interesting, that you throw everything in at the beginning and yeah. then you pull them back. Yeah, um, yeah. Is that fun? Or is that no, awful? that's awful. That's awful. <laughs> yeah, that's really awful. Like that's awful. Yeah. That's always like googling office manager jobs or yeah. like mo like moving back to Kerry or that's the full blown like mm. this is terrible. That's yeah. the work. Yeah, that's yeah. The, I guess that is the work. Yeah. yeah, I wish I I wish I knew that like like eight years ago. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because that's really it. There was just like some sort of like care pack that you can have <laughs> yeah. when going through that emotion but it's really awful yeah. and like i think uh, it should be a tax huh it should be a tax in college like i yeah. think so mm -hmm. yeah because it's like because that is the bit where you're like burning everything and you're like literally 
yeah, you're moving country, you're like excommunicating all your family members, you're like sorry to all your friends are useless. You know, you kind of like it doesn't it's not just like some drawings, it's like ah oh, your phone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like hopefully your family and friends and everyone will still be there to meet you on the other side and you're like, hello. Um but yeah, no, that's particularly grim. And I think you always well I always get that when I move to a new space. And I, I was talking to my friends about it, um you know that I was t- calling them like exorcisms for a while that I was doing these drawings when I moved to a new studio space and it was like uh, you know kind of very like frantic attempt to try and make something good and then I just ha- would have to do loads of that until anything that I would find remotely passable and the, the horrible thing is as well you know yourself if it's crap you know what I mean like you do know so you can't you get to the point where you can't mollycoddle yourself anymore um, and that's really annoying as well, because there's no shortcut around that, do you know what I mean? Um, so that's really annoying, but I think the space where that happens gets shorter for some reason. I think it does anyway. Maybe it's like fitness, you know what I mean? Like if you keep a level of art fitness up, then you know, you're not like a couch art potato, like trying to get going mm-hmm. again, and like it's sort of, there's muscle memory there for like what was a good piece. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, I, and I would throw out a lot of work, like loads, but then I have terrible like art to art regret as well, um, which is also another symptom. Um, yeah, so it's tricky. Like it is tricky. Do you need to re- like just art commitments? Do you need to rest as well? Because you know, I, I think I said this to you in the post mm-hmm. night about Melanie Melanie Gilligan says that yeah, you should keep one foot out of the art world. Um, oh yeah, because for sanity's sake. Yeah, definitely. And like for me, like working in a pub is absolute mm-hmm. like. That is like a massive um, dose of art therapy. Just like stay out of it, do you know? Um, because it's you need something that you shake it off, you know, and it, like you, you you move into a different space where for for eight hours you don't think about it. You know what I mean? Because I think art like there's um there's a syn- um, syndrome called Stendhal syndrome, and it's when art makes you crazy. Um, there's a really bad movie called like Stendhal syndrome, which is like terrible but it's like all about this lady i think she keeps going to a museum to look at a painting and starts like uh, seeing things and then i think she like does she stop the painting anyway it's really bad but um <laughs> that i think that i think that happens very easily and i think like lots of artists have low level Stendhal syndrome where like you and i think that's why i need to stay away from openings i can only do i have to go very easy on our openings mm-hmm. Um, and like I've, um, the last film I made uh, is about um, stones who are recovering from art addiction and they need to like stay away from finales and stay away from triennials and like it's said in jest but like, some of that is very serious like I went to the Venice Biennale and like bawled my eyes out on day three um, because I was just so overwhelmed and like so I just it was too much you know just like literally too much so um, yeah for me I, I definitely need to keep one foot firmly out and it's always interesting that idea of like would I be like an art farmer or like what would I do like something else and also give you something else to talk about you know what I mean it's so boring like sometimes just like oh, you know um so I think like keeping yourself outside of it is very very good like you know like having a family or a washing machine or you know <laughs> <laughs> just like something mm. different it is it makes you like it makes it, it very you, much feeds into your work isn't it? so you kind of yeah you know, probably need it to make it work it's, it's like a relationship yeah, like totally. you, you can't burn it out like you need to give it a bit of space and like take it out for dates and like be nice to it like take art out for dinner and you know mm. like yeah <laughs> yeah 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 um like i suppose like we're talking about an art scene that's very like there's this cliche about the artist says what art is but really I've never found it. I've found communities say what art is. So there's different there's an art scene and then mm-hmm. there's different communities that say what art is. Yeah. And there's a specific art scene, I suppose we're talking about that is you know, that grants or just that funds usually go towards the original art scene. That perhaps emanating from Dublin, you know, the centre of that. So um, being part of that mm-hmm. is quite difficult because it is part of the whole systems come with that, the whole networking thing comes with that and all that stuff mm-hmm. is part of the baggage. And your work kind of reflects on that and it's kind of not, in, in a way it's a nice thing mm-hmm. that you're kind of recycling all that stuff that everyone else is thinking about. Yeah. Um, 
what they kind of did, like I'm doing for me, I'm doing a proposal at the moment. Mm, mm, it's mm. a nightmare. But then when you've done it, you've done it, you sweep it away and then you go on to mm. what you like doing. But um, mm, mm. is it is that like reflecting on that stuff all the time must be kind of like, you know. Um, I think as well, like it's kind of like I find it very similar to other uh, structures you have to jump through just every day, you know, like taxing your car or like paying your phone bill or mm. you know paying your rent and you know like the kind of um what's it called the like clerical side of life mm. if you like you know that that's kind of so inherently there and you can't mm. avoid that and that's just the way life is but um yeah i think like some of my jokes about like the art world and stuff um I guess there is a split where I'm where and I'm thinking about it at the moment, like how you navigate between art as a product um, and art as a kind of like I know it sounds really naff, but like a lifestyle. <laughs> like as in how do you like how do you how do you kind of come to terms with that? Because mm -hmm. um, obviously on one hand you can like you know, go down the road of selling work and um, and then on the other hand you can remain very like purist and like just get like 80 grand a year from the Arts Council mm -hmm. and that's a nobler, more noble cause and I'm kind of questioning that at the moment because mm -hmm. I think like there has been like a, a kind of trope of like evil capitalist bastards you know if you start to sell work in galleries and that the, the, you know there's I think there's more unpicking and unpacking to be done mm -hmm. within that and that's kind of what I'd like to look at kind of next kind of yeah. body of work maybe because I don't think you can divorce it you know what I mean mm -hmm. um but then it's kind of, I mean, I had a really interesting chat there when I was working at the bar like last week, and um, an, un, an unnamed artist said that um, uh, she had an unnamed, an unnamed curator friend of hers had uh, been at work and was a bit bored and decided to add up um, the Arts Council funding that another unnamed individual had received over the last three years, and I think it was like 360,000 euro. So it's just really interesting when you kind of start to throw up some of these kind of questions. And I mean, this is not new in any uh, manner at all. Like, as in London, it's really highlighted that for me. You know, as in like all the kind of like background politics of like how um, public spaces are funded or how private spaces are funded, and like there's there's a gallery called the Zoopolis Collection in London, and they are they they're like an arms manufacturer, and they you know, a lot of artists boy boycotted them when I was doing my MA. So, but just all those dynamics are kind of interesting. I don't know how interesting they are to like, persons who are not necessarily active in the art world. Yeah. So I would be wary of making work solely about that because I don't want to divorce people from, like I, I still want the work to be very much about like the everyday, mm. um, you know, and about shopping myth and about like, sex assault. And, you know, like yeah. I don't want it to be, I mean, I don't know, I suppose the other thing I think about as well is I don't know um, how it would be if I still was working out of my dad's hen house down in Kerry. You know what I mean? Mm. I don't know what if I, if I, would I have completely imploded, mm. become a washing machine saleswoman mm. or... I don't know, like, do you know, mm. like, so in a way, like, it's, I've got permission now to joke more more loudly maybe because I'm you know in the fire station and I did the residency and I think it gives me more permission. Mm. But I don't necessarily find like for me that's that that's been really beneficial and positive for me. But I did find it really funny um after making a video about like getting sturdy over it's from sheep all of a sudden I had all these curators emailing me being like, oh, are you available on Wednesday? And I was like, ha. Huh. Your dad is in your work, and it's very, like, I suppose I put down a few words here. Mm. Your dad is in your yeah. work a lot. Yeah. And um, I spoke to him the other night, actually, mm. in the pub. And uh, he was very like in a way he was very interested in your work and how it changed mm. and um how he loved your painting and loved mm, it, but mm, his mm. conceptual work was a little bit um <laughs> yeah. like why are you doing that like you know and um, yeah, yeah but he had the same humor as you and the same kind of way the same kind of wit in a sense that talking about it mm. ironically he was kind of funny about it 
like I think we're very sim I think we both have very similar mm. conceptual art practices and mm. I think that's exactly what he's doing down in Kerry. I think the whole retired farmer story is complete nonsense. Um don't, I don't believe a word of it because like even we both have um high disregard for each other's conceptual work. Mm. So like his latest conceptual work was to build two houses sorry, two, he built three houses um that were actually legally supposed to be two houses and I had um, a huge issue with this because I found this a real absurdist conceptual move on his part. <laughs> <laughs> and he, so, so uh, as much as he would, you know, like our conversations around these things are quite similar, and he would be very philosophical about like materials, and like there's a, an object down in Kerry that it's like a, a concrete core that his friend. Um, drilled out um, of, a, of a wall of his house down in Kerry shortly before he died of cancer and dad speaks really kind of like lovingly about this, this co just this like small concrete kind of cylinder and about how it kind of symbolifies this person who you know was really crazy and like you know he was the first person that dad ever met who had crabs when he was a teenager you know it's all these kind of like really lovely stories and like real warmth and it's all consolidated into this like concrete object and from, like that's what I make my work about and dad is doing similar lee and i guess in a way we're both each other's like we're re we're quite harsh with each other and I, and I and actually i think it's i think it's been really helpful for me kind of bounce like having to push like i've never um he, i've never ever had an easy ride with um you know uh kind of like him, you know, he would never come out and be like, oh, that's, that's fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I would drop dead. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and how did he feel about being in your video piece then? Was he... he, yeah, he's really, like, he, I mean, he still would be, like, muttering away saying that I should contact Ward Vault uh, about, you know, you know, getting, like, the video on the Wild Atlantic mm -hmm. Way because there's mountains in it. Um, he likes being in the video, I think, actually. Um, and he likes being involved, like, and I think, yeah, he's got a very quiet presence in the video because he's not a very, he's very good on camera for me because he doesn't act, he just is, he's just very there and he doesn't try and be anybody else, he's just there. And he just walks on and off the camera and, it, and that, like, makes sense with the work. Um, but I think he, I think he likes being in the video. He liked, he came to the event opening and, he was really pleased because people were coming up to him going, oh, you're Laura's dad. And they were like, he saw you in the video. And he was like, great. <laughs> so he likes that. But he would be my harshest critic, for sure. For sure. Like, he, he especially told me that he most hated, in this show, he most hated the small pink piece as he come in the door, but didn't realise that that's also one of my works because it looks quite different to these. Um, but I kind of enjoy that about him. You know, we really... And I, I equally would be... Would have... Would have um, very uh, kind of negative views in some of his building work, but he he uses text in his work a lot actually. So in these these um, three houses, which are like semi legal, he um, he wrote our name, he cast our name in concrete above each one, like Laura Jane and me, myself and my three sisters. So he uses text a lot, and I and that's so ridiculous. Like who cast their daughters' names in concrete above the door? You know, like there's a great absurdity in that work as well, and then. Because it's an illegal um, housing development, he made a really nice like um, like what do they call it in estates when you have the like estate name, um, but he he's called it like Retention Avenue, but he's cast it in concrete and like he had a meeting with the planning officials a couple of days ago and they came out to visit and it was really official like you know like hello Mr. Fister I see you've been doing some legal stuff here. And he said that they walk by like completely poker faced past Retention Avenue. I just thought that was so great. Like that was like that's so so absurd. And it's like really gorgeous, like all stone face and really fancy and like he's gonna put lights in it and everything. But like so I I officially have like an illegal house on Retention Avenue. You know? Sounds like someone who needs to go to the toilet. <laughs> you know, it's like really yeah. Um so yeah. So he's there. You want any questions? Um, I just was curious about something you said earlier mm -hmm. about uh, when you made the drawings of stone and mm -hmm. uh, you know you said you felt quite sad about all that. Do you think mm -hmm. maybe that that sadness is might be influenced by the idea that 
you're making these kind of things that are, you know, the brevity of sort of our lives compared to, you know, the idea of the stone and geological time and how slow it is. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Gosh, you're going to make me cry there. That was really sad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. And, like, again, um, I think I'm just going to have to bring God and future artist talks. It's really unfair to quote him so much. But, like, he, one of his favourite topics is death. He loves talking about death. Loves it. You know all the running and the racing you do to, like, I often laugh at myself as I'm, like, you know, like, you know, charging down the road to try and get the next thing completed. Like, do you ever catch yourself and just go like, Jesus, I know it's really, like, I know you shouldn't be going around thinking about death all the time, but just sometimes, and I, and like, I often, I often have this thing, which I'm sure other people have as well, but I often think like, God's great, I haven't been hit by a bus. You know, it's like, <laughs> like, nice one, like, haven't been killed yet. <laughs> as you like, trundle your way down to the next, like, hurry to overcome, you're like, that's deadly, I haven't been killed. Yeah. You know, just like, what's, like, what are the odds, you know what I mean?